Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. A call to order. Ah, wow. This December 2nd, 2015, public hearing to consider certain amendments to the Clackamas County Zoning and Development Ordinance. Before we begin, I invite you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today we'll, today we'll conduct our deliberation on ZDO 254, a legislative amendment to certain portions of the Clackamas County Zoning and Development Ordinance, including amendments to sections 106, 202, 315, 316, 317, 401, 406, 407, 510, 511, 512, 513, 601, 602, 604, 822, and 1307 repeal of section 801 and addition of a new section 841. The purpose of these amendments is to adopt regulations affecting recreational and medical marijuana related land uses. Over the past few months, a large number of people have attended meetings on this issue and presented written and or verbal testimony to the Planning Commission or to us, and a large amount of information has been submitted into the official record. Today's continuation of the land use hearing that began November 23rd is reserved for County Commission deliberation and decision only. Assisting us in the hearing today are Clerks Kevin Moss, um, Mary Rathke, who's not sitting here, but Principal Planet uh, Jennifer Hughes, Assistant County Counsel Nate Bodeman, and our County Administrator Don Krupp is also here. Before we proceed with any motions related to the ZDO amendments and staff recommendation, I would entertain any further discussion on the topic of opt-out, since the result of any further discussion on that topic could affect our decision related to the ZDO amendments. To continue the opt-out discussion that was started and then tabled at our business meeting last Thursday, I would ask for a motion and a second in that regard. Uh, Chair, could you clarify what you're asking for? I'm asking for a motion, any motion that anybody wants to make about opt-out. Well, I, I think that's, pr I, I, would, I would prefer that we um, just not discuss that. I'd just do with business at hand right now and perhaps discuss that today, later, if, if at all. Uh, I don't, yeah, Jim. I move we put on the ballot um, an opportunity to, for people to vote to opt-out. Second. Okay, so it's clarification, Commissioner Bernard made the motion, Commissioner Smith was second. And so your intention there is to opt out totally, completely. At least the motion is that. We'll yes. see how people vote. Yeah. All right, further discussion. I'll, I, I guess I'll just jump in and say that um, uh, the way the motion is worded, I can't support it. Well, that'll be interesting. Um, are we ready for the question? Well, uh, is there a suggested amendment? Um, Perhaps later, after we've uh, digested all this material and to find out what what regulations we actually think will um, perhaps withstand the test of reasonableness, and after discussion of what revenue streams we might have. So I think they're all relative things that we need to deliberate and discuss and, and share knowledge about before uh, that discussion is even ready for me to actually craft a, a particular motion. But I can't support it as as uh, as stated, Jim. Oh, yours was on again. Commissioner Smith. Um, an opt-out's an opt-out. Um, I don't think we need a lot of fancy language to do it. 
We've heard from a lot of people who say they wanted us to opt out, so now's the time for the commissioners to vote on it. Adding a revenue stream to an opt out, I do not think is constitutional. Um, you, you vote for the policy and then you vote for the revenue stream. Additionally, I think, Nathan, um, anyway, it's the way the legislature works. We can, at a later date, go for a 3% tax in Clackamas County, which I plan on supporting. Um, but I think we need to get these regulations set and move forward uh, regardless of any type of audit. Now, that doesn't preclude people from gathering signatures and opting out yourselves. And we have several people here in the front two rows um, who are encouraging us to opt out. So if you want to um, put it to a vote of the people, then um, you can, the same way that we had a vote on Selwood Bridge, Urban Renewal, and what was the third one? Light Rail. Light Rail. Uh, and those people worked very hard uh, to get the attention of county commissioners, although I can assure you, you have my attention. <laughs> attention. I just happen to gris disagree on this particular policy issue that it will do us any good, and I've given my reasons why, and those have been accepted and ignored by others, and that's your purview to do that in a free society. But um, to add a bunch of language on opting out, you either opt out totally or you go and run with the show. So I don't know what other language we could add to an opt-out that would make sense to voters. But uh, I would be willing to listen to that. Okay, a clarification, Mr. Bodeman. Um, you know, 3,400 is 3,400, and 91 is 91. But can uh, citizens start an initiative at any time prior to the November uh, election next year? Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay, all right. Commissioner Savas. Uh, well, first of all, I wasn't, uh, just to clarify, Commissioner Smith, I wasn't going to suggest we put financial or fiscal language in the motion. Um, I just thought that we ought to be digesting that material information and get clarification. So I have questions posed for staff based on the material that was submitted um, since our last meeting last Monday on the, the first hearing. So I think it's uh, our responsibility to digest the information, have everything in front of us, um, and then make those kinds of decisions. So to rush into a motion at this point, I think is premature. Um, I will add uh, with the question just posed to uh, Mr. Boderman that, um, as I understand it, that if we put some, if we opt out later next year after licenses are issued, that will put people in harm's way that will be granted a license with the presumption they can proceed, invest monies, and uh, somehow that will be, I, I'm sure that will be a problem for us should we try to either grandfather them in or try to outlaw them af after the fact that we'll be subject to uh, damages, uh, legal damages from there. So I don't suggest that we wait if we're going to opt out uh, or wait for the, for the voters to do that. So. But I would like to uh, just um, discuss this later on, but if there's going to be going to continue with the discussion, um, like I said, I, I can't support it as, as uh, stated. Uh, Commissioner Bernard. Isn't there a timeline on putting it on the ballot? Don't we only have until... That's for us, though, That's not for right. citizens. Oh, okay. So for us, it would be the 25th of December? <laughs> I just picked that out of the air. But it's a second that, agenda. That, that date would ensure that no recreational facilities uh, are potentially grandfathered in, and, and the date would really be uh, January 4th. Okay. And so if an ordinance is adopted after that date, there's the possibility that uh, OLCC could process license applications and they could obtain land use approval uh, through our planning department, uh, and at that point they would more or less be grandfathered in. Yeah, so further comments are I, I've looked at who, uh, you know, who voted for it, who supported it, attended a meeting in the uh, villages at Mount, no, it's changed, they're looking at changing the name to Mount Hood Villages. And, um, you know, there was an uh, uh, informal vote taken last night uh, about the various levels of marijuana sales production and growing, and, and there was support, um, a, a very high support um, for that community, uh, you know, opportunities to have retail and, uh, up at the mountain. And, uh, you know, I think that 
you know, I voted no. I read the measure. I had a fairly good understanding. Um, 3,400 changed some of those things. I, I'm very concerned about the the crop it being a crop, which I think really limits our opportunities on EFU, but it was a decision that was made, and I, it would not, in fact, opt out would not, in fact, affect that. It would not. So that means it's here anyway. Uh, and then the personal grows. Um, I had an opportunity to speak to somebody today. You know, a, a single marijuana plant, mature marijuana plant, can produce a lot of marijuana, which would in turn be a black market for those people that um, do grow. Uh, you know, I, I think it's the responsibility of the voters to understand what they're voting for, and I think the voters uh, uh, made that decision, and we need to stand behind it. So, you know, it seems to me that we should take a vote now anyway, even though we don't seem to satisfy Mr. Savas's uh, concerns about this. So I, I think we should vote on this. Commissioner Savas. So I guess I'm going to pose one of my questions I wanted to ask later on, but I'll post, pose it now. So um, to the administrator, um, based on the material um, that was emailed out to us Wednesday afternoon uh, from uh, Department Director Barb Cartmill with regard to the re potential revenue estimates, I think, Commissioner Savas, I've got to uh, ask you to relate it to the motion currently on the floor. It is. I, really? I think it's a, I mean, if we're going to talk about a motion to opt out, then I think knowing the financial consequences, isn't that, isn't that relative or, you, or relevant? Well, you'd said that everything here is relevant to the opt out vote as well, and we should wait till after this. And certainly you're capable of making a, a, a motion after this one at the end of our deliberations about any form of opt out that you choose. So we will definitely talk about revenue. I think we have already to some extent. But um, uh, if you're asking the county administrator a question um, as to do with revenue, uh, I don't think it's per uh, per particularly germane to this discussion. I, I think it absolutely is because let's say the revenue is uh, drastically short of meeting the expenses the county will incur or the taxpayers will incur. How is that not relevant to the vote? Um, Mr. Krupp, would you love to answer that question or what? Uh, I, I can. Uh, I don't have the actual written material in front of me, but uh, is mm -hmm. I, I, I do recall the uh, revenue estimates, uh, and this work, of course, was uh, put put together by Mr. Nate Boderman uh, on, on behalf of the, uh, the staff. But uh, yeah, you've got a copy of it there, I believe. All the commissioners have a copy of this. The, uh, sure. the, it, what I understand, and these are very, very rough uh, figures based upon um, uh, assumptions uh, about levels of activity, but my understanding is is that uh, the 10 percent of the 17 percent that would uh, uh, come to uh, Clackamas County could range anywhere from 100 to about $300,000. Uh, should uh, the, <clears throat> the county uh, put uh, a proposal on the ballot to assess what would be a 3% tax. Again, uh, very s sketchy in terms of what an estimate might be, but the best estimate we were able to come up with was about $180,000. Okay, so the, uh, on that same sheet, there was a reference that showed here at the bottom that potential, ex I, I suppose the word potential is not there, so I'm adding that, but it says under expenditures that, you know, A, full-time uh, employed code enforcement officer would cost $110,000 a year. Um, uh, one FTE deputy sheriff would be $115,000 and a sergeant would be $135,000. So based on the um, topic that Commissioner Bernard just raised with regard to uh, rural retail and rural marijuana activities, which we um, adopted time, place, and manner earlier this year, and we specifically excluded that because of the cost to enforce that. Do we estimate that it'll be just one deputy to cover all, one more deputy to cover all of Clackamas County and one sergeant, or is that just, that's the cost of one deputy and maybe more are needed? The, the figures there simply uh, represent the cost of those positions. There's not an effort there in that particular paper to 
discuss uh, what would be an estimated uh, requirement. And in fact, I think the figures uh, provided uh, regarding law enforcement and, and the sheriff's office was pr principally a, we don't really know uh, what uh, the <coughs> level of demand for law enforcement services may or may not be, uh, and prefer to take a wait and see uh, perspective. The dollar figures just simply tell you what it costs to put an officer on the road and, what, uh, and a sergeant uh, in, in the office to handle. Uh, and then the, the code enforcement office uh, position is, is pretty much the same way. It would add capacity to the code enforcement office. Uh, can't estimate what level of activity or how much of an individual's time might be undertaken in doing code enforcement work uh, with respect to uh, uh, enforcing this ordinance this time. Yeah, so that, I appreciate that. So when we adopted the time, place, and manner, uh, and we decided not to expand retail outlets, uh, at least medical at the time, in the rural part of the county. You know, we did that because we just didn't have the coverage, as I stated just now, uh, the coverage for the Sheriff's Department. Um, do we have any idea of what it would actually take to do that properly, to actually get the coverage? My informal discussions from with the members of the Sheriff's Department, um, several folks, was that, you know, ranging numbers of what that may be, and being there informal, I'm not going to share them here, but do you have any estimates, or do we have any estimates as to what that would cost <coughs> as you do? Any estimates? What you see in the way of the staff work on this particular issue is the paperwork that you have in front of you at this time. I, I just think that if we make any decisions, we ought to have some firm numbers on that because this is something that, that the revenue clearly um, will not support financially, just in this one factor alone. The, uh, the reason I want this up front is to settle it, hopefully once and for all, and go forward with establishing some pretty darn tight regulations, uh, tighter than anybody in the state of Oregon, I believe, has done. I know Deschutes County has come down um, with some proposed uh, things that are pretty tough as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I'd like to get going on this and finish this thing. And so to that end, I believe we're ready for the question. Kevin. Would Commissioner Bernard. Motion? Oh, repeat the motion, please. Uh, Commissioner Bernard moved to. Oh, repeat the motion. Yes. He's doing that. He, yeah. he's doing, he yeah. moved oh, to. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Bernard moved to pursue the opt out measure and refer it to the voters. And Commissioner Smith seconded the motion. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Right. Commissioner Bernard? No. Commissioner Smith? No. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Chair Ludlow? No. Okay. Fails, three to two. All right, on with the matter at hand. Let me grab a hold of my script here. Um, <clears throat> moving now to the specific ZDO amendments uh, and staff recommendations, we will hear from Gen Jennifer Hughes, Principal Planner. Good morning. Um, I don't have a lengthy staff report today. We did that last time, but just a bit of an update. You have um, a worksheet in front of you, and I know copies have been made available to the audience also, um, that we've created to assist in your deliberation and decision today. It is very similar to the worksheet that you had for last week's hearing, um, but we've added a bit in terms of some staff comments and a few recommended changes that staff has. In addition, you'll see that on the left-hand side, you've got letters um, assigned to each of these issues that we're hoping will kind of help track the discussion for um, an eventual uh, motion and decision at the end. We've also got a column where we've, we've identified the sections of the Zoning and Development Ordinance that would be amended. So if you were to want to refer specifically to those uh, materials in your packet. Um, the topic, of course, is identified the current Planning Commission slash staff recommendation. So that's what's actually in the draft text, text amendments now. We've summarized that, the key points. And then the final column on the right is additional staff comments and recommendations. So some of that is just to provide some context or to address issues that have come up either from commissioners or staff or testimony. The items in red then are staff's recommended changes to the draft that you have in front of you. And I think maybe it would be most effective to highlight those as you get to each item rather than to try to sort of dump all of that on you right up front. I'm certainly happy to do it either way, but I'm thinking it might make more sense um, to do it as each item comes up. 
I also wanted to just mention, and I think I've had a chance to talk to each of you about this previously um, individually, but this issue of if you approve something today, what date will it take effect? And so staff would actually recommend that if you do direct us to uh, draft an ordinance for your um, adoption later this month, that it be done in two parts so that the provisions that relate to recreational marijuana would take effect on January 4th, which is the first business day of the new year and the date that OLCC would begin to accept license applications for recreational marijuana uses, but that the provisions related to medical marijuana take effect March 1st. The reason for that is that House Bill 3400, um, which gives the county more authority to regulate medical marijuana processing and production, um, the provisions that relate to the medical marijuana law don't take effect at the state level until March 1st. So we would be premature, really, in adopting the provisions that relate to medical production and medical processing. The retailing is fine, and we've already got that in the county code, and as you know, we're proposing to amend those provisions and move them into the zoning ordinance. So there, that would be seamless. We would continue to have those regulations in effect, you know, continuously. Um, but for uh, medical production and processing, March 1st. So we would do that through the ordinance process with two different effective dates and exhibits that implemented them separately. And so that would be our recommendation. That is all I have, unless you have questions. Well, there have been a lot of questions coming up, I yes. believe. Um, so as she said, we, they've prepared, prepared a worksheet for the board that categorizes the major elements. Uh, in order to keep the discussion on track, we'll ask if a commissioner would like to make a motion to approve ZDO 254 as recommended by staff. If that motion is seconded, we can discuss what changes we will want to make to the staff recommendation by following the categories identified A through Z as set forth in the left column and basically do amendments to that main motion. It may not be necessary to discuss every category set forth on the worksheet, and as we go through them, and get down to T or Z, it doesn't preclude the commissioners, commissioners from going backwards and readdressing any of the letters that preceded that. Uh, the board may skip any category they want and simply, uh, and that would be simply adopted as part of the main motion. So I'll call for a motion of ZDO 254, Commissioner Savas. I'm not, I'm not gonna make any motion, but I just wanna, before we got too far along, I wanted to hand out um, something from Multnomah County each, each of you a copy. It's the September 2015 uh, Multnomah County Vital Science. It's re basically a report uh, on the uh, public health issues re regarding legalization of marijuana. It was referenced at the AOC conference. I think you'll pay, find page four and the table on page five, um, extremely informative. And I think it gets back again, gets back to the cost es estimates or the, uh, the impact factors. And, uh, but not relative to the motion and not relative to um, whichever, whichever part you wanted to start on, but I just thought you all had to have that before you got too far along. Okay, getting back to the, the, um, the um, motion. You, on the suggested motions, you can also move to approve ZDO 254 as recommended by staff and amended by the commission. And that way, as we work through this uh, and we amend uh, or not, uh, uh, then it'll be encapsulated in the end. Commissioner Smith. I'll make that motion. I move we approve ZDO 254 as recommended by staff as amended by the commission. And amended, okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Uh, I just want to comment that this is a little different way to do it, but it's an awful lot. And so um, there'll be lots of amendments. Yep. And I, uh, and I understand it'd be easier to do it that way than to make the giant motion with all the amendments. It would okay. be. Uh, Commissioner Smith with the motion, Commissioner Bernard with the second. Um, <clears throat> okay, now, back to the worksheet. So don't we need a second? We have I mean, a vote? No, again. Okay, I, okay we're, we're gonna do that a, at the end. This right. is the mo motion's on the floor. Okay. We will take the vote as amendment, amended after we finish our deliberations so that we can't amend in the middle, okay? Do we anticipate voting on the amendments? Sure. Yeah. If you want to amend any of these. So if we don't we vote on it. Over, overall arching motion, yep. that's, that's on the table now. Yep. And then we'll make votes, we'll be voting on amendments Correct. under that umbrella. Correct. Okay. So A, and you can see what uh, ZDO section this relates to. Um, definitions, marijuana use exempt, et cetera. 
You note that the staff notations on this um, are lawfully established medical marijuana uses that qualify as nonconforming use under ZDO and state law. So does anybody want to amend anything that has been proposed by the Planning Commission in regards to A, and again, this doesn't preclude you from coming back later, and doing so, Commissioner Smith. Oh, that were, you weren't up there. I tur didn't turn you off. All right, proceeding on to B, industrial zones. Um, marijuana retailing currently is prohibited in the industrial zone under time, place, and manner. Uh, there are those who have contacted us who would like to see retail in, in the uh, industrial campus areas. Commissioner Bernard. Well, I, I would like to amend this to uh, permit. Oh, no, no, I don't. I don't want to. I had the wrong letter? Yeah, that's the wrong. I, I'm not interested in retail. However, uh, I think this is something we might want to look at later on. I can give a couple examples. Danner Boots, who used to be in Omark Industrial Park, at one point asked for a small retail facility, which we allowed. Bob Dreadmill, Dave Skiller Bread, folks like that. Uh, once they were established, uh, we, we went back and looked at that retail portion. So um, I'd just like to say, you know, right now I'm okay with this, um, but I want to talk about, you know, in the future looking at how we would accommodate some retail. Now, some of the retail, depending upon what the zoning is, which industrial zone will make a difference, and, and that's the kind of detail I like to get into later. So I'm good with this for now. Oh, okay. You, that'll come up under something else. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Um, it, uh, processing is allowed here. Is that the primary processing and tracking? All, yes, all types all of marijuana processing. processing. Okay. Correct. So, so I got to go back <laughs> to this. Yeah, too. go ahead. Are we, is this where we should be talking about maximum size? Um, if you were to want to apply a maximum size limit in the industrial zone, um, you could discuss that here, or you would have to sort of remember to bring it up when we get down to the specific eight standards in Section 841, where we're, for instance, applying a size limit in our, you know, proposing to apply one in RF5. Um, it might be better here, um, just because we may lose track of it later, because there's nothing in 841 right now that would apply in the industrial districts. Yeah, and so I am going to bring it up here because I, um, I agree with Commissioner Savas and some of his comments about, you know, absorbing all of our industrial structures uh, since it's going to be indoors. I have some concerns. OLCC's uh, size uh, varies on different. I actually have something over here on that. Varies on what uh, particular uh, zone, a uh, tier level, and. Um, Right now, it, it regulates the canopy size, which generally refers to mature plants, and meaning that I could have 10,000 square feet of mature plants and uh, 30, 40, 50,000 square feet of immature plants. So I have some concern about absorbing industrial uh, buildings by allowing that part. So I, I would uh, propose that we limit the, the size of the marijuana facility to 10,000 square feet. Now, just a clarification, um, is that 10,000 square feet of growing operations or the size of the building? No, that's of growing operations. So you could divide buildings, but uh, since my understanding is that you can't have two grow facilities in the same building, and you might want some clarification on that. Uh, I, it would be in, in the, in, it could be divided and one could be a marijuana grower. Is, is it true that you couldn't have two licenses in the same building? Ultimately, of course, that's up to OLCC, but our read of the OLCC rules is that they are not limiting the number of grow licenses per property. They're limiting the size of a grow for whoever owns that license, and they're not allowing the same owner to have two grows on the same site. But if I owned one and Nate owned one, they could both be on the same property, and there is a requirement for some kind of separation, but it wouldn't have to be in a completely separate building. I think 
a wall is what you're saying? Yeah, the OLCC rules provide for this producer may designate multiple grow canopy areas at a licensed premises, but those spaces must be separated by a physical boundary such as interior wall. So one of the things that, that had happened um, that we know of about a medical grow is somebody rented a big warehouse and then they wanted approval to build a little, a much smaller unit inside of said warehouse. And so, you know, uh, the grow operations is important here, but, but so ultimately, if you rented a huge warehouse, you could have all kinds of separate little structures in there, yes. is what you're saying, that's by correct. Multiple, multiple growers. That's, yes, that's our understanding, and certainly that's true under the ZDO regulations as proposed currently. Um, I would say if you're interested in regulating size, then we do need to be clear. Are we regulating the number of licenses per property? Are we regulating the size of any individual canopy? Are we regulating mature plants, immature plants, the building size? Is this just growing and not processing? Because uh, it's going to need to be very specific in terms of, of what we apply the, say, 10,000 square feet to. And is it canopy? That's what I'm trying to do is be more specific. Right, right. Right now there's no limit proposed in industrial. So, Jim, if, um, if you said 10,000 square feet and they had a 50,000 square foot building, then um, that's, that's what I'm thinking. If it's a, one license, he could have 10,000, another one could have 10. And but, but one owner. Oh, it's the owner of the license. Right. That's the way OLCC truck. regulates it. And it's even somewhat odder on the medical side because they're regulating per address, which doesn't equate very well to the way we do things. Um, the way we've got it worded for the RFF5 and FF10 zones, it's the size of the building used for production. So it doesn't matter if they're immature plants, mature plants, you know, if it's where they're doing the packaging, what, it's 5,000 square feet, which is easier for us to regulate if it's a cap that just applies to other than, rather than us having to go in and measure canopy and all that. Um, and it's per lot, what we call under the zoning ordinance, lot of records. So that would you know get around this idea. You might be able to have three licenses on the same industrial property, but the sum total, they can split it up any way they want, but you're still capping on that property. So that, that would be analogous to what we're doing in our FF5 or proposing to do. Commissioner Savas. So when we initially started off on this process months ago, um, I was, as Commissioner Burrard is responding to, um, very concerned about our limited industrial land and my concerns prior to the um, OLCC regulations and the clarification, I was concerned that we could have these mega industrial sites where, you know, thousands of acres or thousands of square feet of land um, could be, or industrial land could be used up for commercial grows. And since then, there's been a cap applied, as you were talking about now. So I'm less concerned knowing that it's about, about the industrial aspect of it. I'm less concerned about the industrial, placing it industrial uses there. Um, but what's going to we're going to, I think we're going to go back and forth a little bit, at least I am in my head going to go back and forth thinking, all right, well, it'd be nice to put them in one place, in one kind of zone. So if it's all, let's say we decided, decided it's industrial zoning, it's going to be limited to this size, you know, maybe there's a spacing requirement, put all the grows, commercial grows, that is, in industrial land, that gives me a lot more comfort on this one particular item, B, here, B, the letter B, um, on this form. Um, but if we're going to open it up to everywhere, EFU and RFF5 and 10, and it's really <coughs> everywhere that can be allowed, then I have a different viewpoint on how we approach B, item B. Sure. So I appreciate your willing to work on that, Commissioner. Um, and as I understand it, uh, one licensee, 40,000 square feet, 10,000 feet of canopy, but a family member could be a licensee, a separate licensee, right? And they could have an adjacent building separated by a wall and have another 40,000 square feet with 10,000 10, square feet of canopy. That's our understanding. Is that the indoor production limit, Nate? Uh, 40,000 square feet is the outdoor production So there'd limit, be no so. outdoor production in industrial districts as we've proposed. So they'd have the smaller canopy size per license. But you're correct. It's, it's based on who own, essentially who owns the license. So it's not going to get at the land use concern that I think we've heard voiced about just too much 
either too much land being used or too much marijuana being grown or whatever, you know, whatever the concerns are. I don't see the OLCC standard really. I think their standards are aimed more at competition in the market than they are at the land use impacts. So from what, uh, based on our field trip and others, um, when we went out to the second site here during the summertime and that had a harvest that was, or a, a grow that was in harvest and it had the odor and um, they had carbon filters on that facility that we went and viewed. It was a small facility, but when we got out of the van, the as soon as the door opened, I could, I could smell that. So, um, and perhaps without the carbon filters, it would have been a lot stronger. And it was, certainly was when we got inside the building and they opened the door, it was a lot stronger. So um, my concern is that if we saturate an industrial area with multiple grows and you, you compound multiple grows with what does escape through the carbon filter, um, that would be a higher concentration. I, I would assume it would be a higher concentration um, because these carbon filters are not magic. It's not like they remove everything. They don't. They, they, they remove a lot of it, but they don't remove all of it. So um, I don't want any false security that somehow the carbon filter is magic and it just takes it all out. It does not. So with that, that's why I have a concern about oversaturating with mul multiple licensees um, on in one particular, well, we call it an acre or you call it a, uh, an industrial campus or whatever it may be, that we ought to have some kind of a, I think perhaps spacing um, uh, of these facilities. Mr. Smith. Um, I want to correct um, Commissioner Savas on something. He said um, about us opening and up everything to uh, grows. It's not us who are opening it up to grows in all zones. It's House Bill 3400. So whereas that's already allowed in all the zones in House Bill 3400, we just set time, place, and matter. I think that's really important to understand. Uh, the reason why uh, I'm concerned is, uh, let's talk about the um, secondary processing of oils. Is that allowed in any other zone except industrial? So as it's drafted now, we have not distinguished between the various types of processing. So the statute defines processing of concentrates, processing of extracts, and then what they call products, which are basically edibles and topicals. The extracts are the ones that involve the most hazardous processing methods. Concentrates next, and then edibles and topicals, apparently not so much. Mm -hmm. um, that's my least rudimentary understanding from reading the statute. Uh, currently, we haven't attempted to distinguish. So processing right now, they could process any of those things anywhere we're proposing to, to permit processing. One thing you'll notice when we get down to, I uh, see what letter we're talking about here, but when, when we talk, get to the one about rural residential, staff had suggested you might want to consider not permitting extract processing there. Um, I agree with that. You know, in the industrial districts, that's the most logical place, in my opinion, to permit the extract processing. There are also a lot of other hazardous things that are processed in our industrial zones, so it's somewhat so, consistent. Um, at, at this point, I mean, I agree with your opinion on that. The industrial zone is the most logical for extract processing. Can we make an amendment that says that? So should we maybe, f we could, how about if I flag that for when we get to the yeah, we're not, rural we're residential still on the section? Because we won't need well, to make a change here no, for that. I would like processing to be in the industrial zones, the extract processing okay. to be in and the And that is covered zones. now, but let's, okay. I'm going to make a note to flag it when we get to the rural residential. Because I think it will be easier for um, uh, fire and police to respond in the event of uh, a hazard, a dump, a fire. Yeah, I don't really want the ext extract processing out in the farm and forest zones. I don't think that's a proper use of it, or the residential zones. Okay. Commissioner Bernard. Um, so I think that you offered um, a proposal, uh, and I think because, because of the way you defined it, which is uh, the specific property, uh, I'd like to hear that again, but I probably want to amend my size a little bit. Okay. Because uh, um, if, if you're including office space and everything else in that, you, and storage, and perhaps processing, you know, for oils and stuff, you're going to need a little more space. So I was thinking more in the 20,000, limiting it to 20,000 square feet. Uh, which is not a lot. No. 
uh, but I think it would be sufficient. And since I'm trying to be reasonable, and that is the test today that we're doing, uh, I think that would be more reasonable. So give me your, because I'm I want to form a motion on on B, which give me that again. So the way we would typically regulate something like this under the zoning ordinance is based on what is called a lot of record, which basically means it's a legal separate piece of ground that can be sold off by itself. Um, and so that's typically how we would apply a size limit. And that's what we would do in the rural residential that as proposed. So in the, in the rural residential, we did 5,000 for growing production and 3,000 for processing. Obviously, you may change that today, but we had a, you know, a distinction. You could certainly, you know, yeah, if you want to do one for production, one for processing, or a combined, or we don't care what you're doing, but this is the cap, I would say based on a lot of record would be the easiest way for us to implement it. Okay, so I move that we limit the marijuana facility to, uh, to, uh, to 20,000 square feet per lot of record in industrial zone C, I, R, I, is that an L or an I? I. Uh, R, I, G, I, L, I, B, and B, P. So Second. one clarification, currently campus industrial wouldn't permit these uses at all. It's an industrial zone, but oh. it's, the, it's the one that's just so the that's one. That's the C, I. So, yeah. I, uh, so like I'm going to okay. drop the C, I. So just R, I, G, I, L, I, and B, P. Second. All right, motion by Commissioner Bernard, seconded by Commis Commissioner Smith. Now let me get a clarification on this. You said 20,000 square foot limit. Yes. Now what's that a limit on? That's growing, processing, storage, office space, everything to do with the building. With the marijuana. Everything else. Okay, everything. Okay. Not yeah. The canopy. Yeah, I'm talking about. So you could have a forty thousand square foot building, right? Where you've got twenty thousand square. They're growing. They're doing all this. Yep. And the other 20,000 could be doing something else. Some but other But they tenant, could not be business. two marijuana grows in one structure. Hmm. I mean, if you, if you went out 212, I went out 212 because I drove up to the mountains uh, last night, and uh, there's a brand new giant building. I can't even imagine how I many thousand square feet. In that giant building, you could not have more than one marijuana facility. Okay. That's what I'm trying to get at your issue too because right. you, you know if you go out to boring and you got a 40,000 square foot building, I don't want the whole building taken for marijuana. Hmm. But it's reasonable, it's reasonable, that's the test I'm using to limit it to something. Right. Now, a clarification again. Now, having been a real estate broker for many years, a lot of record, okay? Sometimes a lot of record is more than one uh, legal lot. That a lot of record is because, because of uh, usually of the, of the fact that it is smaller in characteristic to what is a legal one, and they add those together. My concern on this is that by a lot of record, for example, there are, I'm sure, industrial parks where there are multiple buildings on a single lot of record. Is correct? Right. That is correct. So by the way this is worded, only one of those buildings to the tune of 20,000 square foot could be utilized even though there were three buildings on the same lot of record. Is that what you understand? Yes. I mean, I think the way this would be written, they'd get 20, I mean, as I'm conceptualizing this, they'd get 20,000 square feet on the lot. They could do two 10,000 square foot buildings, four or 5,000 square foot buildings, half of a 40,000, however they choose to divide that up, but that would be the cap on that just that legal piece of ground. Yeah. Yes. Commissioner Savas. Well, I, okay, that does get to my concern. And because uh, some of these industrial areas are right, you know, adjacent to residential areas. So we have a lot of that, especially on the 212 corridor, you know, we have a lot of that as well. And in, even in Oak Grove. Uh, so I, I'm supportive of that change. I did want to say one thing but before Commissioner Bernard made the motion that was, I know that Commissioner Smith used the word correct, or uh, I'm just going to use the word clarify. So 
granted, the bill said EFU, you can farm it, but an RFF5 and RFF10 or rural residential, we can um, choose not to allow that. Okay, so that's why I said everywhere. So if we were to take RFF5 or RFF10 and just limit it to EFU because it's in state law, then, mm -hmm. then, then I'm, I'm, that was my point that I would be more comfortable with. Um, well, we're with coming to that process. pretty soon. We can come to that. So this is about industrial zones. The motion is um, to limit 20,000 square feet the entire operations of a marijuana operation per lot of record. Is that the way we all understand it? Yes. Yeah. Are we ready for the question? Kevin. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Bernard. Aye. Chair Ledlow. Aye. Passes 5-0. Now we are on C, commercial zones. Let me ask you, under permitted, it says processing except primary processing. Go ahead and define those for us, Jennifer. I love this question. I've been anticipating this question. <laughs> it's coming. And I wish I had a really great answer for this question. Um, I've even Googled it, and it hasn't helped me. The, um, the reason this works this way is not because of something particular to marijuana. It's because in these specific commercial zones, I think there's five of them, that language is already in our code. It's been in there for years where you can do processing, manufacturing, processing of anything, essentially, as long as it's not primary processing. So I think the best example, at least from another industry, is you could not bring logs in and mill them in a commercial zone. But if you have lumber and you want to make cabinets, you can. That's secondary processing. So when it comes to marijuana, I mean, there is going to be some need to interpret this, frankly, as there is with every other industry. But an example, if they had sort of a marijuana product that they'd already created and they then wanted to turn that into brownies, for example, you could do that in one of these zones. So that's, that's the idea. And extraction? I think that that's probably going to be, I'm looking at the planning director, primary processing. But... Yeah, I, I think but, not. Okay, I, I would not, I would not like processing in the commercial zones. If you were want to want to clarify this, you could do this a couple different ways. You could simply not. You could exclude marijuana. We treat it. We just chose to treat it the same way as every other product. That this wasn't some like we think these zones are more appropriate. It was just fitted into the current construct of the code. So you could not allow it, or you could exclude. Um, the, con the extracts or the extracts and the concentrates explicitly as opposed to relying on an interpretation of primary processing. Yes, I would like to do that. So, go ahead. So, um, let's say I, I'm going to bake brownies, which might be That's a reasonable secondary. thing to do in a commercial zone. You may have a restaurant facility where you're Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? I think that would be permitted. Okay. Yes. So what she, what Commissioner Smith is talking about is I'm getting 50 pounds of marijuana and whatever you do to turn it into oil mm -hmm. uh, would not occur right. in a commercial zone. Right. That's but what I want. I think staff would actually be quite comfortable with you being explicit in this case about what kind of processing you would like to permit. Because there's enough ambiguity in that existing term in the ZDO that it could benefit from some. Okay, I would, I would like to amend this to say that the secondary processing in commercial zones of brownies and edibles is okay, uh, but not extracts or concentrate. Okay, so I don't know if that's a... Motion. I mean, you know what I mean, All edibles, right. brown, that type. Yes. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner Schrader. So um, is that is that good enough for to, for definition? I yes. Mean, I, there was kind of specific the, versus more broad. The statute um, delineates, and so if we exclude the if we exclude extracts and concentrates, that's very clear what that means. Good for you. Mm -hmm. All right. And yep. my, my can I state my reason why? Certainly. Go ahead. Because to me, in a commercial zone, there are a lot of different businesses that are lined up that are not marijuana and may not want their business exposed to what could be leakage, what could be uh, down the road, possibly, I'm not saying it will, possibly a health hazard or a fire hazard or anything like that. So that's my reasons for doing that. Commissioner Savage? Uh, without me digging through all my paper here, could you just go over the definitions of what 
what or an example of where we have a village community or is that what that is, the VO? Village office. Village office, where, where give me an example. Where, where are those? So the village zones exist only in Sunnyside Village out south of Sunnyside Road, about 142nd, 152nd. Some of that area has been annexed to Happy Valley now, but we still have parcels. So it was essentially a planned, you know, a special plan. And so there are only like one or two pieces of village community service land, and I think only one piece of village office land. So it's very specific, and they have some unique characteristics about them. Um, but in some ways, they match up with our other zones. It just depends. So is any of this in the rural area, any of these zones under processing, like go down to permitted, where it says sure. permitted? Um, um, none of the zones that permit processing are in the rural area. Okay. The zones that permit wholesaling are rural commercial. And the two zones are rural commercial and rural tourist commercial. Those are the, the commercial zones in our rural area, those two. Okay. And Commissioner Smith's motion is specifically to the processing portion of C, because I want to talk about the retail uh, retailing outside the urban growth boundary. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Any, anything on, in red under our staff comments, we should address either by ignoring or enacting something. Uh, Kevin, read back the motion for us, will you please? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Smith moved that the secondary processing would be okay in the commercial zone, but no extract or concentrates be allowed there. And Commissioner Schrader seconded it. So preliminary. Okay. What happened to brownies? And brownies <laughs> included. All right, are we ready for the question on this one? All right, Kevin. Yeah. All right, uh, Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Bernard? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Chair Ludlow? Aye, passes 5 0. Now, Commissioner Savas, you wanted to discuss, the, again, the red part says staff recommends either permitting as a primary use or prohibiting recreational marijuana retailing in unincorporated communities rather than relying on the conditional use process. And I assume you did that to uh, lessen the load on our staff on a continual basis. I, I, maybe that's part of it. Um, I don't know how many of these we would really see over time. Because of the buffer requirements between dispensaries, you're still not talking about some sort of unlimited number of recreational dispensaries. Um, I think it really stems from our belief that the, the reasons people don't want marijuana retailing in the rural area don't necessarily fit real well into what we evaluate for a conditional use. So we'd be putting somebody through a conditional use process and we're gonna look at things like traffic and do they have, you know, sewer or septic systems or water service and you know and yes, the neighbors may object, but that they're going to object probably based on the fact, understandably, that it's marijuana, that they're concerned about security issues. And we're just concerned the conditional use process isn't really good for that, and that it makes more sense to make the public policy decision here. Is it allowed as a retail use in the rural area, or isn't it? And then and if it is, it just falls under our normal process. I would agree with that, actually. Commissioner Bernard. I think. Well, yeah, I was, yeah if I could, oh, I could follow up. Yeah, so yeah. my, my follow-up is that, you know, my concern, as I stated earlier, is really the cost to um, police that, enforce it. And um, these are going to be, especially if they're out in rural areas, that they are going to be, um, I think, magnets for uh, crime in that you're out in a rural area, uh, there's, let's say, little to no limited, limited law enforcement out there. Um, these are cash businesses. Um, I think they're going to be attracting uh, opportunity for for to be these folks to be robbed, and um, I, I think that's a danger to um, a number of folks, and so that's my and that was our rationale to some degree why we had the time, place, and manner and excluded the retail, rural um, outlets. Yeah. Are you prepared to make a motion in that regard? I. I oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Bernard. First. Well, you know, I only somewhat agree with you. Uh, my the way I look at it is is the burden is shifted when you don't allow it there you shift the burden somewhere else that means that folks on at the mountains uh, Malala you know these communities that are unincorporated would be forced to drive well it, let's say in a zigzag they would have to drive because Sandy right now is opting out right Going for the vote. Yeah, the, they're yes. going for the vote. That means they'd have to drive to Gresham yeah. to, to buy marijuana. And, it, the, and the reason I'm good with this 
Allowing it is the distance between marijuana facilities. So government camp, for example, could have, I, somebody suggested that we already had planned to put two there, but it's probably two because of the thousand foot distance, right? So yeah, our rough, you know, we did draw some circles on a map with the buffers. And it, it, it's obviously gonna depend on where the first, if one goes in, then Could there really the may only be one yeah. spot. Um, but because medical and recreational are distinct, you could, in theory, have two medical and two recreational, it would appear, in government camp. But they would have to be cited just right to make that happen. And that may not obviously be the case. But, yeah. I, but, I, but back to the burden thing. I mean, you, you shift the burden to the that's rural really community, yeah. and, and I don't think that's fair. I also, you know, I, I did attend the uh, Mount Hood Villages meeting. Uh, there was l great support for retail outlets up there, and I, I, I would not support not allowing retail in those rural areas. I think the money issue is hopefully short-term, uh, and you know, I think that some of this needs to be addressed in the fee structure for these facilities, and we haven't really talked about the fee structure, what we're going to charge to process the application, uh, and think we need to talk about that, make sure it's adequate to, uh, and I assume the fee structure's only, it's, it's, it's more, it's more than once, or is it just once? Uh, but we can answer that a little. So we can talk about that in fee structure, and, and I wouldn't support not allowing retail sales in uh, unincorporated county, because again, I think it shifts the burden. And, and, and if you look at the voters up on the mountain, it was quite high in support. I haven't looked at those precincts. So, um, Getting back to the, and, and by the way, I, we've had um, medical marijuana operations in this county now for four or five months. We have not heard any break-ins or thievery going on. And since October 1st, they've certainly been dealing a lot more money, the medical ones, because they've been selling recreational marijuana as well. And I haven't heard of one break-in or, uh, or robbery of any kind. So um, I like, you're right, the separation um, denotes that it would be, I mean, in the, these small communities, well, maybe they get one, maybe two maximum. So, um, uh, Commissioner Savas. So I just got a what if, you know, knowing that um, Clackamas County is growing and um, a growing community. Uh, watch that word. Uh, but should should the um, let's say that there's two retail outlets in in government camp. That way, that was. Your, your reference, right, yeah. to in government camp. And there's no school up there, I gather, right? I don't think there's no. a school. So if, if, if the community grows and suddenly a school gets plopped down right between the two retail outlets, um, it, that's, they're grandfathered in. There's really not much that could really be done, right? Right, but you know, you can argue that all over the county, sure. but it, it's, gonna, it's gonna shift in our urban communities too. You know, as they become part of the UGB, uh, you know, that, that will shift and we don't, you know, we lose control, we gain control, it depends. I, I just don't know that you can argue that. I, I mean, if you talk about uh, uh, Welch's, um, um, Zigzag, for example, there's a school just not far away, so Zigzag probably won't have one. Uh, but there are other areas. I, you know, why I agree with your concern, I think that it's still, you know, there's lots of things that could happen. I mean, I've lived here my whole whole life, and I have not seen government camp grow a hell of a lot. <laughs> Most of those are rentals, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hotels. Right. Well, my, my, my concern over the crime still stands. You know, crime knows no boundaries, and um, that, that shooting in, in Multnomah County at the um, medical retail facility, I think, resulted in was it three deaths, two deaths? So that, that was that was the Multnomah County. So you know that's in that's in an urban area, obviously. But um, I don't. My my concern is that emergency response out that far um, is just 
it's just too too risky. It's just not out there. Um, uh, so I'm, I can't support it. Okay, again, on the red, if we leave it like it is, it requires a conditional use process. For if, recreational, but not for medical. Of course, always. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, that was the Planning Commission's recommendation. You could change it. Yeah. Um, if the Commission wants to change that to an outright use, uh, allowed use, a primary use, they call it, uh, for recreational, then we would need a motion to do that because it would change what the Planning Commission put forward. Commissioner Bernard. So I got another question. Do, does the legislature or has uh, OLCC uh, limited our ability on distance on retail? Yes. Okay, Joe Well, Fowles. OLCC didn't. House Bill 3400 says we c if we're going to have a buffer or a separation distance between recreational retailers, we don't have to have one, but if we're going to, it cannot be more than 1,000 feet. Medical, there's a state-mandated minimum of 1,000 feet. So the proposal that you have now is 1,000 for all of it, but mm, there's no separation between the two different types. So it's crazy making, but that's how it works. Um, Mr. Boderman. Yeah, just a point of clarification on the motion. Uh, the, the master motion on the table is to approve ZDO 254 as, a, as recommended by staff. And amended by the commission. And amended by the commission. And so uh, everything in red on the deliberation and decision worksheet, that is official staff recommendation. And oh, so if you want point. to revert to the planning commission recommendation, you'd have to make a motion then uh, to do so. If you do not make a motion, you automatically incorporate everything in red on that worksheet. I see. Okay. That's so helpful. That is helpful. So currently, again, here's the red. Staff recommends either permitting, well, I don't know how that's a staff recommendation. <laughs> either. Give me an either. <laughs> that didn't work very well with no. our motion structure. So much for that, Mr. Bodum. <laughs> staff recommends to, uh, as a primary use the retailing of marijuana in unincorporated communities. It's pretty much synopsize that doesn't matter. Yeah, one or the other, either prohibit it or make it a primary use, but don't use the conditional use process. But you, yes. I mean, this is as staff recommend, recommended. Which one of the either <laughs> is it? Right, right. I, we don't have a strong opinion either way, to tell you the truth on this question. Well, I, I want to personally lessen the processing uh, of this stuff through our, our planning staff. If, if it's, you know, this is, this is retailing, this isn't, the processing of the material, the wholesaling of the material, the growing of the material, this is, this is retail only we're discussing. So is it the intention, and I don't think we're going to take a vote on it, but is, do we understand that the staff recommendation is to, to allow as an outright use, so primary I, use? I think we should clarify by making a motion. In this case, I'll uh, move that. Um, um, what do you mean? I know it's okay, tough so to read from I'll, that. I'll move that. Um, I'm still trying to, uh, that retailing, okay, so I'm not really sure. Uh, I move that retailing is an outright uh, use in the zones. In unincorporated communities. In unincorporated. It's, it's in the red there. Well, it doesn't really, say, it says staff recommends either permitting as a primary use. So I, I recommend uh, <laughs> still. Can I do it for you? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I move that permitting of retailing be in unincorporated communities. Commercial as zones. Yeah, as a primary Commercial use. Zones. As a primary use. As a primary, as primary use. use. That would cover it. Okay, let's read that back, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, so Commissioner Smith moved that we permit the retailing in the unincorporated communities. As a primary as use. As a primary use. Uh, in those zones. In the zones that are listed here. The commercial zones. In under C. Under C. Under C, yes. It's a change then. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we definitely need that clear. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, if you left, if you didn't include the zones, then we can just answer the, the either or question right now. Well, we are under C, and C is specific about the commercial zones we're working on currently. Right. The only two zones that this issue applies to are rural commercial and rural tourist commercial. And I just want to, one point of clarification, because there's been a lot of discussion about government camp in your discussion. So there are other unincorporated communities that have commercial zoning. There's eight of them. So let's just, <coughs> I just want to make sure that everybody's 
on the same page that it would be allowed in all eight if they can fit within the school buffers and the separation distances. If you wanted to limit it to government camp, you could certainly do that as well. Okay. Kevin, read that one more time. Okay. Commissioner Smith moved that retailing is permitted as a primary use in the unincorporated communities under letter C. Second. No, it's, it's already been oh, made was a it? second. Yeah, I just asked him to clarify. Oh, okay. No, it did not have a second it didn't? on it. No, there no. was no second. She was. All right, thank you, Jim, for the second of that motion. Oh, yeah. Okay, further discussion about that. Now, again, we all understand that this is in commercial zones as delineated on the far left only. And it is to allow, as a primary use, the retailing of recreational marijuana. Okay? So, yeah, go ahead. So, I got a question about how close, we still have limitations on housing, how far the housing is away from these facilities, correct? Not at the moment, but we are going to, I think that's Z, seriously, on your sheet. So we will be, yeah. I'm sure, having much discussion about the buffers. Okay. So this is just a question of whether you want to allow it, and then you can discuss what conditions you want on that later. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Are we ready for the question? Okay. Kevin. Commissioner Savas? No. Commissioner Bernard? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Chair Ludlow? Aye. Passes four to one. Um, okay. Are we done with C? No. No. Well... All right, go ahead. I, then. I, I thought that well, now, now I'm getting confused. I thought that the motion was to to answer the question in red and separate the either or. I did. He did. She did separate it. Okay. So then, then what I'd like to go back to is the discussion on the processing, well, the wholesaling, the wholesaling and the retailing in rural communities. Okay. So go ahead. I, rural commercial, you mean? Yeah, so I, I, I move that we do not allow um, wholesaling or retailing uh, outside the urban growth boundary. All right, is there a second? All right. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, what's the definition of wholesaling? <laughs> Great question. I we, know. we think we know the answer. Okay. But there seems to be a lot of information out there that suggests that maybe it's not entirely clear, even at the state level. The definition in House Bill 3400, and I am paraphrasing, but it is essentially the middleman. You buy from the producer or the processor, and you sell to the retailer. So there's no direct sales to the public, mm -hmm. and it does not include processing or growing. Those are separate. Mm -hmm. So that is the way it is defined. If it ends up coming out differently, it will be inconsistent with what the statute says. Okay, I have a follow-up question. Um, if we're going to have retail outlets and if we're going to have grow outlets, then wholesaling is quite essential as but part of the no business. There's no grow operations in there, too. I know. I'm talking wholesaling in general. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so wholesaling is an essential component to the business model, to the overall business model of marijuana in, in whatever you do, right? If a farmer... Can a farmer then, a grower, sell it directly to the retailer? Sure. Because that would be considered wholesaling. So that's why I did not second Mr. Savas's motion. So this is part of what's confusing about the way these licenses have been set up. Because of, or the definitions, because wholesaling is defined as buying from the producer, for example. Well, obviously, if I'm the producer, I don't need to buy it from myself. Um, I think there's an implication that the grower or the processor could sell directly to the retailer and not use a middleman, but it is not clear in the statute that that's the case. So we can't really address that, but that's the assumption that, in my mind, is that the farmer would be able to sell directly to the retailer. He wouldn't have to use a middleman, but okay. a wholesaling license would be the middleman. Okay, so there is a wholesaling license. There is. There okay, is. that's yes. the same as, okay, this is how I'm trying to view it. I'm a grower of Christmas trees. I sell my Christmas trees to a wholesaler. You know, this, it's a kind of a nebulous, because uh, it's really not a bricks and mortar thing. He directly takes them out of my field and puts them to a retail lot. Okay, is that the type of wholesaling we're talking about? 
I'm getting some nose shaking in the head. But I, I think there's a lot of confusion, frankly. That's because that's, that is the typical agricultural wholesaling. Right. So I don't know what wholesaling means. And my second question is then, would it be wise for us not to deal with wholesaling at this time? So we can't not allow wholesaling in the county somewhere without an opt-out. It's one of the things you would have to opt out of. As this is drafted now, wholesaling of this truly licensed wholesaler, whatever OLCC decides that is, but by definition, it's a middleman. I don't know how they would come down differently, but it would only be permitted in the industrial districts and in these two rural commercial districts that permit um, wholesaling of other agricultural products now. That's the way it's drafted. Okay, but I'm concerned about that language because a farmer wholesales too. So correct. you have to allow it in the EFU as well as the... Sure. Jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah Mr. Just Bodeman. A, just a point of clarification here. So OLCC's regulations allow the producer as part of the producer license to uh, sell or okay. deliver usable marijuana to the licensed premises of a marijuana processor, wholesaler, retailer. Okay. Laboratory, so it, it, it's included as part of the producer right. license. They don't have to go out and obtain a separate wholesale license. For purposes of our zoning code, we wouldn't treat them. I mean, that that, that sort of accessory to their primary use of, of growing and. Oh, and okay, Paul. That's why I didn't second your motion because I was concerned about the term wholesaling, that it would um, not allow it at the farmer because you said outside the UGB which is our EFU zone and timber zone. Yeah, so if I can, so when I, I think, I mean, I'll, t I'll just say this. When I read the 78 pages of old LCC rules, mm -hmm. it really changed my whole, my concerns in, mm -hmm. in some areas. So they could, a wholesaling could be potentially, well, it is. It, it will likely be a magnet for theft, okay? Um, you're either going to have a large quantity of marijuana that, that <clears throat> demands a lot of, you know, the demands a good, chunk of change to purchase. And if they transact on the facility, that will turn to cash. So they can still have a lot of marijuana and a lot of cash, either which, they're both magnets for crime. And so I'm trying to, my motion was to keep that in the UGB where we have adequate law enforcement versus outside the UGB. So your motion was to not allow wholesalers outside the UGB? Correct. Okay. I think, uh, wasn't it retail? Wholesaling? Wholesaling, wholesaling and retailing, yeah. Yes. I, I, okay, yes. so that's where the retailing's thrown in there, which is the problem. Uh, you know, my concern is, again, back to size. Uh, and you may be able to address this. So at this point, we could have a wholesaler in a commercial zone any size. I think that's true. There are some limits generally on the size of commercial uses in rural areas that are mandated by the state. So you essentially can't have, for example, Walmart in a rural community. There's a cap on the size. But um, I'll need to check this. But typically, there's an exemption for farm-related uses to that size limit. So I think you'd have to put a cap on it if you wanted one. And I will, I'll double check that right now. Mr. Bernard, anything further? Well, I, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I think that we need further clarification on this specific issue. I, the retail part of your motion I wouldn't support because we just allowed it. Uh, we just voted actually to allow retail outside the UGB if we're going to the mountains, but we didn't address. Well, no, no, I think the vote we just voted on was the clarification in red, uh, the either or. We answered the either or question. We didn't yeah. allow the retail commercial. So I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll retract my motion and I'll restate my motion. We'll do it one at a time. I move that we not allow wholesaling outside the UGB. Is there a second? Okay. The motion dies. And you want to make a different one as, as well? I move that we don't allow retailing outside the UGB. Is there a second? All right. Getting back to C here, any other thing that we need to vote on uh, in regards, and we can always come back to this, like I say. So, yes, Jim. So, when we get to development standards, can we talk about caps, size of, of a wholesaler? 
Sure, or you could do that now the same way you did with the industrial. Um, I'm not confident that in looking at the existing limits on size for commercial uses in those areas, I'm not 100% confident that they could there wouldn't be an exception available. So I would suggest if you want a cap on the size, you probably want to impose one. Um, 4,000 square feet is sort of the typical cap on commercial uses in the rural area for other types of uses, so you might want to sync it up with that. I don't see what good um, a cap on the size would be. I mean, I mean, you could get a tractor trailer in 40,000 square feet. That's a lot of, I don't know what that would be worth in money, <laughs> packed full of processed marijuana, or not processed, but, but um, harvested marijuana. But that'd be, uh, I think you can get, you know, a pretty well mint within even 1,000 square feet worth of, you know, if you packed it well enough. So limiting the size, um, I don't see it to be that really all that effective. I guess I my concern is I don't want to see a commercial, uh, a rural commercial zone, also absorbed by a giant warehouse that that is storing marijuana for sale. And, and because you could have a rural commercial zone that's owned by one. One, one person, and they could have, and it could be numerous acres. And so my concern is that it could be, you know, 100,000 square foot of storage. I don't know if there's anything like that in the county, but that's not to say there might not be someday in the future. Uh, is there a structure size in a rural commercial zone? No. It's a per use limitation, not per building limitation. So you could essentially have a like a strip mall, if you will, with multiple tenants that exceeded the four thousand square feet per. You know, each tenant could have. So I, so I'd like to move that we limit um, wholesale facilities in the section C to four thousand square feet. Is there a second? I'll second it. Yeah. Sure. All right. Commissioner Bernard with the motion. Commissioner Savas with a second to limit to 4,000 square feet the um, wholesaling in the commercial zones delineated in C. Further discussion? Well, I won't be able to support it because it's in rural, but I thought I would second it just for the sake of uh, discussion. I think, okay. I think I'm okay with it. Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Bernard. I just wanted to comment. You know, the one thing, if, if I know farmers that sell directly to, like, Fred Myers. They just, I assume they avoid, you know, lots of farmers lost a lot of money because they had a wholesaler in between. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that being skipped. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Siri Farm sells directly to Fred Myers. Mm -hmm. They used to sell the distributor. They'd drive to California. They would turn them down. They would drive home with a bunch of rotten stuff. Now, instead of doing that, they actually, the retailer, Fred Myers, for example, <laughs> will pay them for their crop and they deliver it when it's grown. Marijuana is, is not cases, you know, that take up a lot of space. So I think in 4,000 square feet, you, you limit, uh, you know, massive, I, I'm more worried about the land than the building. So. That's why I'm going with the, the 4,000 square feet. Yes. Let me just clarify, is that 4,000 square feet, is your intent 4,000 square feet uh, per use, per license, or per lot of record? Lot of record. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Savage, you seconded that. Does that change okay with you? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to assume you're going to vote on it, so you all vote on it. Um, I can, you know, sure. oh. I'm not going to support it, but. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you asked for that because previously we definitely talked about per lot of record and, you know, there, somebody could have, like Jim described, a couple acres out there and have um, multiple buildings. So this, this would uh, definitely limit it to that. Any further discussion? Or are we ready for the question on uh, the limitation? All right, Kevin? All right. Commissioner Bernard? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? No. Chair Ludlow? Aye. Passes four to one. Any further changes to C? All right, we're down to D. Urban residential zones, single and multifamily, prohibited all regulated marijuana land uses. I bet there's not going to be a problem with that. No, I don't. I'm just guessing here. This is okay. E. 
Similar, Mount Hood urban area residential zones prohibited, prohibited everything. Mm -hmm. F, higher density rural residential zones, RA1, RA2, RR, future urban 10-acre district prohibited all regulated marijuana land uses in rural area one acre and two acre, et cetera, RR, and 10 acre FU 10. John, I expect a lengthy conversation on this. Can we break for 10, five minutes? Oh, you ready now? Yes. Well, let me do this. If it could take a couple more minutes, we have to give these guys warning back there, that, and I was about to. Um, if we could go through a couple more and uh, Let's uh, let our. Oh, I just uh, wanted, I did want to say let on. Me, let me finish. Okay. Let, let, get our camera people. Um, the idea that we're going to break in five minutes. Now, Commissioner Sabas. So, um, I do want to talk about F. I F. Just, I, I want yeah. I want definition of what higher density. Ra one, Ra two, because we have the zone, but we don't have densities. I guess that necessarily match what the zoning is. Mm -hmm. So I need clarification on what that, when we mix those terms, what higher density is. Is it simply by the zone or is it simply by actually the actual real density right. that's so, actually there in place? Right, so it's based on the zone. So it was our way of just trying, to, because we're now moving into the rural discussion and the same section of the code deals with multiple rural districts. Um, so we've sort of distinguished between the ones that have smaller minimum lot sizes versus larger. But that's what you can do now, not what the previous development pattern was before it was zoned. So I think the point you're making is you could have lots that we do have lots that are much smaller than the minimum lot size that is established currently. Mm -hmm. And that's the case. We're talking about zoning. So for this F, it's the zones that have minimum lot sizes of either one or two acres. So that's the RA1, RA2, and RR. And then in that same category, we've thrown in the future urban district, which is actually a 10 acre minimum, but it's inside the urban growth boundary and planned for urban development. So it's different in that regard from our other larger lot size zones. Okay, that's all I needed, thank you. So um, any changes to F? Otherwise, we're going to G. Now we get into some. G, rural residential farm forest 5-acre and farm forest 10-acre zones, RFF5 and FF10, prohibit wholesaling and retailing, but permit production as a primary use and processing as a conditional use subject to new development standards. So a couple of questions here. Um, conditional use, the processing, we talked about the extracts things. If, if we're not allowed in certain areas an actual... Um, uh, commercial, I think it was, then why would we allow it in residential? And second of all, um, you, you put subject to new development standards. What new ones are there? Those? Section 841, all okay. of what we're going to talk about, right? Because right, current, yes. That's how 841 is interpreted, as new development standards. Okay, so uh, the question, again, I have is why should we, I mean, I don't know what processing entails, but it certainly sounds like it entails like reducing down extracts and that kind of thing. And so, uh, Commissioner Smith. Well, to me, um, your prohibitions and your permitting are in conflict of each other as far as wholesaling is concerned. Um, I think we should allow wholesaling in this zone, uh, but no retailing, just to be consistent with how we defined wholesaling. Does that make sense? So. This would permit, as it stands now, the farmer to wholesale what they produce on site. See, that's the problem that with using the term wholesaling. So <coughs> I think that means, does it mean, Tootie, that you would give it to the intermediary? Is that what that means? Yes, yeah, so okay. you're de you would be defining this with the amendments to Section 202. Maybe I should just read that just now. Just stop a it minute. Kind of it says prohibit wholesaling. It doesn't say permit it. It says prohibit. Correct but it's the licensing of a wholesaler, not the farmer wholesaling. So the definition of marijuana wholesaling, which is proposed to be added to section 202 and which mirrors what's in House Bill 3400, says the purchase of marijuana items for resale to a person other than a consumer. So it's not the farmer, it's the middleman buying from the farmer, potentially warehousing and distributing. Our original proposal was to have that be a conditional use because it is a conditional use for other agricultural businesses in the RRFF5 and FF10 zone. 
the Planning Commission had concerns about wholesaling and changed the proposal to prohibit that middleman use. So that's the distinction. I, I still don't like that because um, I think it's inconsistent and it's confusing when you, because you, have, you define wholesaling over here meaning this, and then you define wholesaling on this, unless you have two different terms of wholesaling, wholesaling type one, wholesaling type two. So we need to do something on that term of wholesaling before I can uh, support uh, this. Okay. Isn't, if a farmer sells directly to a, a, a retailer, it isn't wholesaling. It's a direct sale, just like the, it was described as about farmers, you know. There is no wholesaling involved. They are the wholesaler, like Jim was saying. They yeah. cut out the middleman. So wholesaling right now describes you taking in somebody else's stuff <laughs> and right. distributing it wherever you want, correct? Yes. But it's prohibited in here, and it should not be prohibited. It should be permitted. It, so you think that on our RFF5 and our an FF10, that somebody should be allowed to take in marijuana from 10 different producers and wholesale it, because that's what wholesaling is described as right now. That's taking in other people's stuff, not producing their own and selling, because if they produce their own and sell it, they could sell it to a wholesaler or they can sell it to a direct retailer, correct? See the differential? Yeah, I do, um, and I'm concerned about it. I'm, I'm really concerned about limiting the use here because because it's a farm forest zone, because of the definition of the zoning. Um, you want to make a motion? You want to wait for some further discussion? We've got a couple of lights on. Yeah, I'd rather wait for further discussion. Okay. Commissioner Bernard, I think, was first. Well, I kind of think of it as my neighbor grows the straw, processes it, and either goes down to Wilco, sells it to them, who I buy it from, or I talk to my neighbor and say, I'd like to buy your, your hay. Uh, that's not wholesaling it to me. And so I, I support this in that I'm not going to go, my neighbor's going to cut his straw and cut the neighbor's, I mean his hay, excuse me, <laughs> the neighbor's hay and everybody else's and put them in a giant warehouse. Uh, actually, near air, the airport, uh, Aurora Airport, if you look to the right, you'll see all this hay or straw, no, hay, in these giant buildings. I don't want to see that. And, I mean, there are actually tents. And that's kind of what I think of as this guy I'm, obviously isn't growing all that. He's bringing it in and distributing it. So it's almost a distribution. You could say the wholesaler's a distributor to other outlets. So that's, I'm okay with this language. Well, then why don't we call it distributing, distributing and not wholesaling? But wholesaling is defined, Judy. It was, she just defined it. Uh, and, we were and trying I, to sync up with the OLCC licenses so there wouldn't be any confusion. And we've linked the definitions to the, I don't know if this will solve your concern, but we've linked the definitions to the OLCC licensing, which as Nate pointed out, now explicitly permits the type of direct sales from the grower to the processor or the retailer as part of the production license. So I, you know, I do think that we have the clarity we need on how to enforce that. Commissioner okay. Savas. Well, I just want to bring everyone back and just mention that this is residential. It's zone residential. And yeah, farm forest, but primarily a lot of people that live in rural Clackamas County don't farm. Okay, and that a lot of them live there because that's where they choose to live. So primarily, it's a residential use. So to have a wholesaling activity on a residential use that is not, they're not farming it, uh, per se, um, is, is commercial activity, not unlike uh, manufacturing, um, you know, widgets or buildings or steel or whatever it may be. Um, it's, it's, uh, it wouldn't be allowed because it's farm forest, but you wouldn't allow that in any re residential area, period. So um, I, I, I think we need to think of that primarily first that it's residential. These are families, houses, communities that are, that are that, where people live with an accessory opportunity to, to farm and forest. Okay. Um, That's fine. I, I can go there. I have a question. Go ahead. And it says, uh, 
Uh, permit production as a primary use and processing as a conditional use subject to, okay, we already decided that processing of extracts and um, the concentrates can only be an industrial, so that needs to be stricken from this residential use. Well, that would be my motion, and I'm more than willing to put a motion on the I floor. Can, or you can do it. Go ahead. Yeah, I can do that. Go ahead. Do that. This is the motion, right? Yeah, this is the motion to permit production as a primary use. And then strike, I don't know, and strike processing as a conditional use. Uh, I, or strike processing altogether? Yes, that's, I, yeah. that's what I was thinking. It's yes, to strike processing altogether. Okay, so. Is okay, I can restate that. There's okay, over ahead. here. Go ahead. Uh, I would uh, move to uh, prohibit ex extract and um, concentrate processing in RRFF5 and FF10 districts. That's your language. Second. Motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner, Commissioner Bernard. Now, the question, Jennifer, is, is it better to just to say to eliminate processing or to be definitive about what type of processing? You could do either, and they are substantively different. So if you want to allow the, what we did in the commercial districts, or what you did in the commercial districts, was allow the processing of, it would be edibles and topicals, but not concentrates and extracts, that is fundamentally different than it prohibiting is. all processing. Okay, do I need to, I will amend my motion to state, prohibit extracts and um, concentrates. That's, so, that's what you said before. Yeah. But yes. you want just to those just two categories, not altogether? all processing. Not all, pro well. I think so. Okay, eliminate all processing in this zone. Second. So doesn't a farmer. Do you agree with that? Amendment? Uh, Amendment? I'll second it and then discuss right. it. Go ahead. So a process, uh, again, I guess if we talk, I'm growing tomatoes, I process them by washing and putting them in a crate. I know, I'm trying. Right, and that's not processing. Um, it's no. preparation of farm products. So that is acceptable. You can, you can wash them, sort them, package them. You just can't turn them into something else. Okay, so I, you, I just wanted to state, and the reason I have my light on, it's been seconded. So I, I live in this zone, and, and uh, you know, it worries me, but, you know, that's a decision that I have to live with. So I just, you know, I, I'm concerned about, about that. But the processing, uh, I, I, which they use gases to burn it, heat it and stuff, like not just like a distillery, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I, I'm good with prohibiting that. Okay. So I, I think I'm good with where we've gone. What we're going to do before we take a vote on this uh, is the promised recess. So I hope our video people have that. We're going to recess until 1110.